I love first-person horror point-and-click adventures. Although most of them haven't aged well, with clunky mechanics, outdated interfaces, and let's be honest, primitive horror elements, I still love playing them. Something about their atmosphere is fascinating to me. Whilst there aren't that many out there, I'm always happy to find ones I've never played before. And recently I played 4 games I didn't know about prior to working on this video. Personal Nightmare, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, Elvira 2, The Jaws of Cerberus, and Waxworks. Although three of them include combat and some RPG elements, at their core, they are still point-and-click adventures. But why am I talking about horror games in a video about Simon the Sorcerer? Well, because I had to see this and now I'm terrified. Jokes aside, I mentioned these games because they were all developed by Horrorsoft, a British studio that was founded by Mike Woodroffe. Though you might know them better by their later name, Adventuresoft, which is the name they used when developing Simon the Sorcerer. Woodroffe was tired of making horror games, and wanted in on the comic adventure craze that was popularized by The Secret of Monkey Island. He was also inspired by Terry Pratchett's Discworld books, and wanted to make a comic fantasy game of his own. In fact, the first game was meant to be a Discworld game, but they couldn't get the rights. Even Simon himself was inspired by Discworld's Rincewin, as well as being inspired by Monkey Island's Guybrush and Blackadder's Mr. Bean. Since they weren't able to get the rights to make a Discworld game, they instead decided to make their own story with spoofs of other works of fantasy, such as The Lord of the Rings, Rapunzel, The Three Billy Goats Gruff, and Jack and the Beanstalk. Even the second game's subtitle is a reference to the Chronicles of Narnia. The first game was a critical success, and even to this day, the game is beloved by many fans of the adventure genre, along with its sequel. Not so much the third game though, and other than a few people I've talked to, barely anyone knew a fourth and fifth game exist. And in this two-parter series, we'll be taking a look at all five games, the first two in part one, and the remaining three in part two. It goes without saying, but there will be huge story and gameplay spoilers for all five games, including the endings. There will also be some spoilers for Monkey Island 1 and 2. So if you haven't played any of these games yet and you're planning to do so, I suggest you play them before watching this video. To those who have already played them, or to those who don't care about spoilers, grab a drink, sit back, and enjoy the video. Let's start off with the first game simply named Simon the Sorcerer. Before we move on though, I need to point out something. For some reason, you can only play this game with either subtitles or with speech. You can't play it with both. So throughout this review, you'll see footage with subtitles and footage with speech, depending on what aspect of the game I'm talking about. Anyway, on with the review. As I've mentioned before, the game was a critical success. The critics loved it, and the fans still enjoy it to this day. In fact, a lot of people draw comparisons between it and The Secret of Monkey Island. Fans of the series usually say something along the lines of, It's Monkey Island, but with wizards. The game was praised for its humor, its voice acting, and its puzzles. And I'm just sitting here asking myself, Did we play the same game? Don't get me wrong, if you enjoyed this game, more power to you. But I personally just don't get it. I will never understand why people love this game, let alone compare it to a masterpiece like Monkey Island. It's like comparing the Dungeons & Dragons movie to the Lord of the Rings. Ok, that was a bit unfair, as I don't think it's horrible. It's just boring. I didn't enjoy it at all, and I dare say that those who still like it just don't remember how dull it was. But before we get into what I disliked about it, I'm gonna talk about the stuff that I did like, starting with the game's visuals. The game looks pretty good. I wouldn't call it beautiful, but some of the backgrounds are really well done, and the game overall is quite nice to look at. Nothing revolutionary for its time, of course, however I can see why people would praise its art style. Though I wish they made the hotspots a bit clearer. Most of the time, noticing hotspots wasn't too bad. However, there were times when I couldn't solve a puzzle because I missed an item that wasn't clear at all. Such as this pebble. And this rock. Luckily, if you press F10, you can highlight all hotspots in the scene. But the game never tells you that, and I only found out about it because my keyboard was acting up and pressing keys on its own. 
In fact, I'm not sure this was a feature in the original game. Even the manual doesn't mention it. My guess is that this was a new feature added to the game's settings when optimizing it for ScumVM. Though I can't find any source to back this up. If you know anything about this, do let me know in the comments. The character sprites aren't bad either, and a lot of the animations are quite nice. Or rather, they would be nice if they weren't so slow. For some reason, the frame rate of all the cutscenes in this game is way too low, and I just don't understand why. It's not like adventure games weren't capable of higher frame rates at the time. Here's Monkey Island 2, a game that came out two years before this one. And to make matters worse, the cutscenes are sometimes much longer than they need to be. For example, why do I need to watch this dwarf go all the way down the stairs, grab a gem, put it in his hat, come all the way back up just to give it to me? Why couldn't he have just had it in his pocket? Thankfully, you can skip these types of cutscenes, but if you do that, you're gonna miss important plot points or info you require to solve puzzles. And you can't skip all animations in this game. For example, the inventory animation is unskippable. Every time Simon gets an item, he has to take his hat off, put the item in it, and then put his hat back on. And every time he wants to use an item, he takes his hat off, takes the item out of it, uses the item, then puts his hat back on. This happens every single time, and whilst the first time was cute, by the tenth time you'll probably be sick of it. What's wrong with just doing this? Another animation you can't skip is his idle animation. It's such a small nuisance, but it drives me mad. If you leave the game for a short period of time, Simon takes out his Walkman and listens to it whilst waiting for you to come back. Neat, right? Problem is, you can't do anything during the time he's putting his headset on or off. So if you were about to click on something and he decided that you were gone for too long, that's it. He's listening to his Walkman and there's nothing you can do about it. This entire animation takes about 8 seconds, which isn't a big issue if you were actually gone for a long time, but when you were just thinking for a bit and this happens, those 8 seconds feel like an eternity. The game doesn't even give you that long of a period before Simon starts this animation. All you get is 40 seconds of inaction. So if you get distracted for less than a minute, you need to deal with this. And it just infuriates me. <sighs> Maybe this comment was right about me. The music is good. I especially like the forest theme. However, I really dislike the village theme. It's not bad, but it's the same one that plays throughout the intro. So if you're playing this game from the start, you'll be stuck with this track until you exit the level, and it gets quite annoying. Now we talk about the stuff that I didn't like, starting with the story. It's not bad per se, it's just lazy. If this game came out around the same time King's Quest 1 or 2 came out, I'd understand it having such a simple story. But in 1993? I know what you're thinking. It's a comic game, what did you expect? I don't think that's a good excuse though, as Day of the Tentacle was also a comic game, yet it had a much more complex and a much better written story than this. Yes, it's a silly story about an evil tentacle that takes over the world, but it was also a lot more engaging, and the pacing was brilliant. The game builds up to a pretty cool ending, and it keeps you interested from start to finish. Not to mention the well-written characters. But with this game? I don't know, the story felt way too boring. You play as Simon, a kid who got teleported into this fantasy world by a wizard named Calypso. He wants Simon to save him from the curse put on him by the evil wizard, Sordid. So Simon sets off to become a proper wizard, confronts Sordid, 
saves everyone that was turned into stone by him, then goes back home. That's it. That's the entirety of the story. Bear in mind that this game came out two years after Monkey Island 2, which had a brilliant story for a comic game. However, even if we compare it to the story of The Secret of Monkey Island, it's still quite dull. Look at the difference between LeChuck and Sordid, for example. In Monkey Island, you hear about LeChuck from the local pirates, and they tell you how horrifying he is. He's already a big deal. Even this dog is afraid of him. In Simon the Sorcerer, barely anyone cares about the evil sorcerer that's turning people into stone. None of the wizards care, and these barbarians, who actually came here to kill Sordid, are just lounging around at the tavern. The first time we actually see LeChuck was in a cutscene of him addressing his first mate in a pretty intimidating way. And the first time Guybrush actually meets him, LeChuck was disguised as a new sheriff in order to ensure his plan's success. He even tried to kill Guybrush, who at that point wasn't even a threat to him. He was just a nuisance. How's your first encounter with Sordid? Quite ironic, wouldn't you say? Hey, slime bucket! Pasta la pizza, baby! No! That'll teach you to mess with Simon the Sorcerer. Yep, that is the first time both Simon and the players meet Sordid. Sure, this isn't the end of it, and he does break out after you destroy the wand, but even then he fails to kill an untrained wizard and is immediately killed using a bucket of grease. One might argue that this adds to the humor, but I'm not convinced. You can still have a humorous game whilst having an intimidating villain. Also, what humor? If you ask fans of this game why they like it so much, most of them will mention the humorous dialogue, and honestly, I just don't see it. Is this funny to you? I can smell burning. Hang on. Ow! Ow! Oh! Ow! Oh! <laughs> I'd like to see you do better. Or this? Very well. Be off with... Hang on a minute. I've fallen for this before. If we keep going on like this, then I get butted into the river again. No, no, no! That's all wrong. Referring you to page 23 of the text, I say the he's much fatter than I am bit, at which point you say, very well, be off with you. How about this? I'd better put the ring on now. Well, either I can still see myself, or the ring needs recharging. Hang on a moment. Oh, I had it on backwards. I just can't get myself to even smile at any of these supposed jokes. I can't do anything while stuck in here. That was hot in there. I need a drink. Oh, but Nijo, you have to enjoy British humor in order to understand this game's comedy. Listen, I grew up on Faulty Towers, Monty Python, Red Dwarf, and Tony Blair's years as Prime Minister, I know British humor. Every single joke is unfunny, every single line of dialogue is poorly written, and every quote-unquote humorous cutscene is cringe. The game tries to spoof other works of fantasy, yet it doesn't do anything with the source material. Hey, remember Jack and the Beanstalk? Well, let's make Jack stupid, because that's funny somehow. He doesn't even say or do anything stupid, we just tell you that he's stupid. That's the joke. Remember Three Billy Goats Gruff? Wouldn't it be funny if the troll went on strike, but then do nothing with the setup and just have him get beaten by a giant? That's the joke. You know the Lord of the Rings? Here's Gollum. That's the joke. I'm not even kidding, that's all there is. The joke is Gollum being here. This is Duke Nukem Forever level of humor. Okay, to be fair, there is one joke that was almost funny. What makes you think we're wizards anyway, like? When I move my mouse pointer over you, it says wizards. That's it. That is literally the best joke in the entire game. And what makes the unfunny humor even worse is the delivery. Which brings us to the voice acting. Most of the voice acting was awful. Listen, Mr. Gruff. Every day I get knocked into the bloody river and I'm fed up with it. I'm starving. But when it's not awful, it's boring. 
That's easy for you to say. What did I do to deserve this? This character doesn't even move his mouth when talking. Were these last minute recordings? I can do anything you want with such fine metal. Good, because I need an axe head made for me. No problem, as long as I can keep what's left over. This is absolutely embarrassing. How could they listen to this and say, yup, this is acceptable? You shall not pass. It's not even the funny kind of bad voice acting you see in games like Resident Evil or House of the Dead 2 or heck, even in Cold Blood. It's just bad. I'm on duty, but I suppose one mag can't hurt. This is just speculation, so don't quote me on this. But I'm guessing they didn't have the budget to hire better voice actors because they spent it all on hiring Chris Berry, well known for playing Rimmer in Red Dwarf. They were paying him around £3,000 a day, so let's see if his performance was worth it. Out of the way or the tadpole gets it. I am your Prince Charming, come to sweep you up in my arms. Ah! That was a close one. It wasn't. Next up is the gameplay. The game uses a verbs mechanic that's very similar to that of Monkey Island. Personally, I'm not a fan of verbs. I prefer adjectives myself. <laughs> to me, they feel unintuitive and seem to punish the player over what boils down to semantics. A lot of fans of the genre argue that these verbs add an extra layer to the puzzles, but I personally disagree. Beneath the Steel Sky introduced a much easier to use UI, which was simple, sweet, and sufficient. And it did it without sacrificing the challenge for the sake of simplicity, as the game is full of brilliant and well-designed puzzles. This small rant has nothing to do with why I dislike this game, by the way. I mean, Day of the Tentacle uses verbs, yet it's one of my all-time favorite games. I just thought I'd mention my dislike for verbs whilst talking about a game I hate, because I'm bitter, angry, and quite petty. In fact, I don't even hate this game's puzzles that much. I wouldn't say they were good, I mean the game had its fair share of bad puzzles, such as this one where you had to convince the bartender that the beer barrel was empty by blocking it with wax. At this point, you really had no reason to know that you needed this beer, nor was there any hint that bee wax would do the trick. But that's as bad as they get, and the majority of them are fine. But none of them were as well made as the ones you'd find in other adventure games that were out at the time. I do like this one though, where you had to figure out the real names of these two demons, Gerald and Max. You need their demon names in order to send them back home, but they refuse to tell you what they are, so you have to figure them out another way. In the room below, you find this crying mirror that boasts about its ability to show you anything, anywhere, so long as there's a clear surface around. And since there isn't a proper surface near these demons, you have to make one by placing this shield on a hook near them. Now you can spy on them and learn their names. It wasn't a hard puzzle and it could have been made way better, but I quite liked it. So overall the puzzles weren't bad. My issue with them is how they were spread across the game. Let me explain. The game has a lot of areas you can visit, and connecting these areas is this forest. And that's the crux of my problem with the gameplay. This forest is basically a maze, and although it isn't a very complex one, it can still be quite confusing and is unnecessarily large due to all these useless scenes with nothing important in them. Granted, you do have a map which you can use to teleport around the game, however these areas won't appear on the map until you visit them at least once, which means you're still gonna have to aimlessly wander around the forest for a good chunk of this game to discover all these areas. And not all areas are added to the map by the way. Most of them aren't actually. Which means the only way to get to them is to teleport to the closest point then walk to the area you want to go to, which can be quite a long way from the place you teleported to. To make matters worse, these areas aren't on the map at all, so the only way to find them is to remember where they were, and to travel to the closest point. The game expects you to either have a great memory, or to make your own map. Why not just add all the areas to the game's map? This wouldn't have been a problem if these puzzles were self-contained in each section, however, they're not. Almost every puzzle in this game requires items from an area that's quite far away, so a lot of the time you're just going from one side of the map to the other side just to solve a single puzzle. This is made even more infuriating if you were just in that area but didn't notice the item required. I don't see why we need to waste so much time traveling to the witch's house, get the bucket, travel to the crossroad, 
walk to the area with the beans, pour the water on said beans, walk out, walk back in, get the beans, travel to the village, walk all the way to the back of this house, put the beans in this compost, get the melon, travel to the owl tree, walk all the way to the saxophone player, just to shove that watermelon into his saxophone to shut him up. So yeah, I was not a fan of this game at all. Sure, the visuals were nice and the music was alright, but the story was lazy, the writing was awful, the voice acting was bad, and the gameplay was too slow and frustrating. I'm sorry everyone, but Monkey Island this is not. If you want to play a good point and click adventure with a silly humorous story, you're better off playing any of these. Just skip this one, it's not worth your time. Of course, this is the first of 5 games, so let's see how the second game fares. Before we move on, I need to point out once more that you can't play this game with both speech and text at the same time. Well, technically you can, but for some reason speech doesn't work properly when playing this game on ScumVM. No matter what I do and no matter which settings I change, speech is always being cut short. It is in fact a magical transportation device for crossing dimensions. Obviously someone sent it to get- Okay. I can dig that. So once again, I'll sometimes use footage from my text playthrough and sometimes from my speech playthrough. Anyway, on with the review. Simon the Sorcerer 2, The Lion, The Wizard and The Wardrobe came out in 1995, two years after the release of Simon the Sorcerer 1. Much like the first game, it was very well received. Since I was upfront with my opinion about the first game, I think it's only fair to do the same with this one. Simon the Sorcerer 2 is a huge improvement over 1 and I really liked it. In fact, if it weren't for a few major issues, which we'll get to later, this would have been one of my favorite adventure games. It was a step up from the first game in almost every way. Well, except for the music. Not that the game's music is bad or anything, in fact it's quite serviceable. It's just that I wouldn't really call it a step up. And some of the tracks can be quite tinny and annoying. Other than that, the game's definitely better. Take the visuals for example. Whilst the background art isn't what I would consider a noticeable improvement, though don't get me wrong, it's still quite beautiful, and a lot of the scenes are pretty impressive, it's the improvement in sprite work that caught my eye. The character sprites are a lot clearer here, and they look so much better than the sprites in the previous game. Animations are also a lot better. Well, most of them are at least. Apparently, two years wasn't a long enough time for AdventureSoft to learn how to increase the frame rate in cutscenes. At least it's still better than one. I especially like Simon's idle animations. They're silly, they don't take control away from you, and you can take Simon out of them in a second. Unfortunately, the game still has that annoying hat animation. The story is so much better than the previous game's story. Sure, it's still quite simplistic and can get very silly, but for a comic game, it was definitely much more compelling. And we even get a pretty good cliffhanger. With the help of his new apprentice, Runt, Sordid finds a way to come back to life. However, he needs Simon to complete his plan. So he sends a magical wardrobe to bring the young wizard back to the fantasy world. And there's a lion for some reason. Something goes wrong, however, and the wardrobe ends up at Calypso's house. Calypso tries to help Simon to go back to his own world by sending him to look for something called Mucusade, which will help power the wardrobe. A long adventure later, Sordid kidnaps Alex, Calypso's granddaughter, so Calypso refuses to allow Simon to go back home until he goes and rescues her. After reaching Sordid's castle, Runt gets the upper hand and actually captures Simon. Apparently, Sordid's plan was to swap bodies with Simon so he could go back to Earth 
while Simon stays trapped in Sordid's body. And the plan works. This is how the game ends, with Sordid living in Simon's world while Simon is being bullied by the people of this fantasy world. On the one hand, ending your game like this is quite a risky move. What if you'll never get the chance to release a continuation? On the other hand, I really liked it, and I'm happy they went with this ending. It was quite jarring, and it made me excited to play the third game. Plus, seeing Simon getting bullied was pretty satisfying, since he was an absolute jerk to everyone throughout the whole game. So yeah, overall, I was quite happy with the story. Definitely a huge improvement over this. Pasta la pizza, baby! No! Even the writing is a lot better. We wizards consider time to be a distraction from the pursuit of magical perfection. And would you consider being impaled as being a distraction from the pursuit of magical perfection? That depends on who's being impaled, your majesty. You! Point taken. Sure, the game still has its cringe moments, and I wouldn't call the humor fantastic. Right, Lion. Let's start by establishing who's boss. That's cleared that up then. But it's definitely a step up from the first game. Remember, a tattoo is for life, not just for solving a puzzle in some third-rate adventure game. Some of the jokes actually got a good chuckle out of me. Now for some stretching. To the left. To the right. To the left. I also really like how they used other works of fantasy in this game. Unlike in the first game, where the jokes never went anywhere, in this game they made actual jokes for these characters, and they were used for some pretty good puzzles. It was really funny how they made Goldilocks a burglar, and getting into the three bears' house was a job gone wrong. And Papa Bear became obsessed with trying to capture her. He set up the house with tons of security devices, he even keeps her wanted poster next to his chair. I just want to know one thing. What? Are you in league with the Goldilocks? Who? Her! And in this part, you see the princess, from The Princess and the Pea, sleeping on top of a bunch of mattresses. The game puts all these noise-making items in the room next door that are completely useless, just to tease you, because none of them can wake her up. How do you actually wake her up? by putting a pea under the mattress. And I'm sure you've noticed by now that even the voice acting is better. You mean like a compass? How did you know that? Oh, just a wild guess? It takes all the fun out of helming! I wouldn't call it great, however, I can't think of a single performance that stood out to me as bad or lazy. Well, what do I know? I get two sixes again! That's not fair! I only get a 3 and a 2! That mean that I win again! Unless done intentionally. Actually, being of the class Arachnida, the common spider, Arachnida vulgaris has 8 legs, arranged in 4 jointed pairs. Even the voice of Simon was better than it was in the first game. Well, if it isn't Mr. Sucker! Mr. Sucker? Watch out! Behind you! What? See what I mean? There's nothing there! Exactly! And guess what? This time, instead of hiring Chris Berry, they hired Brian Bowles, a professional voice actor who have voiced tons of characters in video games, including Billy from Beneath a Steel Sky, Hi! You look like a man who needs insurance, ya? Yeah? Pontius from the Trine games, It's all her fault! We must take her into custody! She stole the king's treasure! And the narrator from Divinity Original Sin 2. Currents of magic surge inside you, boiling, bursting, then breaking, only to fade back into your soul like rain into the earth. Well, would you look at that? Why, it's almost as if hiring a professional voice actor, who is specifically trained in acting using only their voice, rather than a stage actor, whom you just hired because they had a role in a famous TV show, gives you much better results. Who would have thought? Weird. When it comes to gameplay, the game was a lot more fun to play than the previous one, that's for sure. The verbs are now replaced with icons, and there are less of them this time around. 
which is always a plus for me. As for navigation, although the game has its fair share of walking around, it was nowhere near as bad as it was in Simon 1. Instead of using an incomplete magic map, you get an overview of the entire city, and choose where to go. And each area has only a few rooms in it, and they're all important. I like this navigation system way more than the one in the first game. Reminds me of Monkey Island. Or Discworld, the other comic fantasy game that came out the same year. They even referenced that game in this one, which seemed to me like a cute way to acknowledge the friendly rivalry between the two games, and I thought it was funny. Did you get the number of that donkey cart? Did anyone get the number of that donkey cart? However, I can safely say that as far as puzzles go, I would choose this game over Discworld any day. The puzzles were so good, though not all of them. Some of the puzzles were pretty bad. Such as this one where you had to go past this dog. See, when Simon saw the dog, he was scared of it. So I thought I had to find a way to get it to move or something. Nope, I just had to pick it up. Sure, Simon is a wizard and all, but you can't just expect me to know when he can or can't solve stuff with magic. This was a pretty unfair puzzle, and it wasn't the only time they did something like that. But those are the bad ones. The good ones are really good. They made sense within the context of the game, were quite tricky, and were genuinely fun to figure out. And some of them are almost perfect. Sadly though, they were always missing a hint or two, making them pretty cryptic. For example, there's this one where you need to convince these two gargoyles that you're the new decorator, but they won't let you in unless you show them your catalog. Where can you get one in the middle of nowhere? See, in this hut, you find a group of role players playing a tabletop game called Apartments and Accountants. Apparently, they are fighting a boss who happens to be an interior designer, and the loot he drops is a catalog. You ask to join them, but they tell you that you can't unless one of them drops out. So after an elaborate puzzle regarding three witches and a potion, you turn one of them into a dog, and now you can take his place on the table. You use some loaded dice that you stole from these gambling goblins, and you're able to beat the boss. Congrats, now you have a catalog. Great puzzle, right? There is just one problem. You're never told that any of this will get you a catalog. That part where I told you that they're fighting an interior designer and the loot is a catalog? You find that out after you sit on the table and start playing. So before that, you literally have no motive to do this other than I wanna see what happens. See what I mean? If they made it clear that you can win a catalog if you play, then at least you would have had a proper motive to do all of this. And it's quite an elaborate puzzle, I didn't even show you half of it. So I basically did all of that just to play a spoof of D&D with a bunch of fantasy nerds. Overall, I liked this game a lot more than the previous one. The story was more interesting, the writing was funnier, the puzzles were much better designed, and I had a pretty good time playing it. If only the game wasn't so problematic. From the misogyny, to the homophobia, to the racism, to the ableism, to the body shaming, it was quite an uncomfortable game to play. I know that sometimes having the protagonist be a jerk can be funny. Would you mind untying me, please? You're a wizard, aren't you? Yes, but... Untie yourself, then. But making your main character a misogynistic prick? It's nice to see a woman in her place. That's a bit too much, isn't it? Some of you might be saying, come on, Nijo, they're just jokes. In order for it to be a joke, it has to have a punchline. What's the punchline here? My name's Simon, not Simone. Oh, only women do the dishes? What's the punchline here? Nice to see a girl who knows her place. Oh, a woman's place is doing chores? Well, that's how the character is, I hear you say. He's meant to be a jerk. Guybrush was also meant to be a jerk in Monkey Island too. However, in that game, he always gets put in his place. In this game, however, none of the female characters stand up to Simon or give him what he deserves. They are either oblivious to his comments, or they just cry and tell him to leave them alone. He didn't tell me you were so rude. I'm only just getting warmed up. Oh, leave me alone. Okay, he's not just a jerk, he's more of an anti-hero. Hey, guess what? You don't need bigotry to make your protagonist a good anti-hero. Also, if these jokes were meant to show us how much of an asshole Simon is, 
then how do you explain the jokes that had nothing to do with him, such as this disturbingly racist character? And what's the joke here? Oh, haha, she's fat under that wetsuit. This is comedy gold right here. At what point does a joke go from being just a joke to being the developer's own commentary? Well, this game came out in 1995, Nijo. It's a product of its time. The 90s were a different time, my gorgeous friend. Okay, first of all, thank you. Second of all, were they though? I mean, sure, we've come a long way since then, but let's take a look at two other games that came out years before this one. In Monkey Island 1, the swordmaster you're meant to beat in a sword fight to prove yourself is Carla. And every pirate on this island admits that she's the best. Kate Capsize from the second game is the captain of her own ship, and is also quite the badass. And let's not forget the powerful voodoo lady. Without her help, Guybrush would have been dead a long time ago. Even Guybrush's love interest, Elaine Marley, turns out to be 10 times more capable than Guybrush is. She flips the damsel in distress trope on its head by rescuing herself from the evil LeChuck, with Guybrush being the one to accidentally ruin her much better plan. This game, however, has none of that. In fact, most female characters were either sweeping the floor, or washing the laundry, or cooking, or doing secretary work. Sure, there was Goldilocks and the Three Witches, but those are characters from other works of fantasy. And even then, they had to rely on Simon to help them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily defending Monkey Island here. I mean, those games have their own issues. I'm just trying to point out that whilst other developers were at least trying to move forward, AdventureSoft thought jokes like this were appropriate. Greetings, humble purveyor of metalware. Greetings, traveler from another dimension. How did you know that? Simple. Only girls have ponytails in this dimension. This game has some very good puzzles, and it was nearly a great game, but it's not worth it. It's not worth humoring these kinds of jokes for the sake of a few good puzzles. Such a shame, I really wanted to like it. But with all this, I just can't. Anyway, that's all for the first two Simon the Sorcerer games. The next video will be out next week, so don't forget to subscribe and make sure you hit the bell icon to know when the video is out. If you like my work and you want to support me, you can do so on Patreon. If you're afraid of long-term commitments, you can make one-time donations on coffee.com. That's all for this video. Join me next time as we take a look at the most hated game in the series and the two that very few people played. Thank you so much for watching.